and welcome to Keep the Bastards Honest, the podcast of the Australian Democrats. I'm your host, Alana Mitchell, and on this episode, the knack falls at the first hurdle. After our marathon budget podcast, I thought I'd give you a shorter, to the point one, with our response to the news that the National Anti-Corruption Commission has declined to open an investigation into the referrals made to it from the Robo Debt Royal Commission. This article was published on our website on the 8th of June, and things have changed since we published, so I'll be back after the reading to give you an update. Robodebt Officers Off the Hook was written and is being read by me. This episode was recorded and produced on Wadjuk country, and I pay my respects to the traditional custodians of these lands, the Noongar people. Sovereignty never ceded. Robodebt Officers Off the Hook In an extraordinary move, the National Anti-Corruption Commission has declined to pursue the Robodebt Royal Commission's findings, saying, quote, it was unlikely to obtain significant new evidence, end quote, and was concerned about, quote, the seniority of the officials involved, end quote. The announcement was met with dismay from the survivors of the RoboDebt scheme, their advocates and the family members of those who took their lives as a consequence of being issued debts that they did not owe. Let's not forget that RoboDebt was both a crime and a preventable disaster. The Royal Commission revealed it as one of the greatest public policy scandals and injustices in Australian political history a government knowingly deployed an illegal compliance scheme against the poorest and most vulnerable of its citizens, and then fought to keep that scheme operational in the face of multiple legal challenges. In the statement, the NAC advised that the, quote, National Anti-Corruption Commission decides not to pursue robo-debt royal commission referrals, but focus on ensuring lessons learned, end quote. The decision to decline to open an investigation into the six officials because the RoboDebt Royal Commission had apparently covered all bases is odd, considering Royal Commissioner Catherine Holmes requested and received permission to delay tabling her final report until the NAC was established, specifically to then make criminal referrals to it. The NAC was the culmination of years of advocacy, not just by accountability and transparency supporters, but in the end by the general public as well, particularly as the full scope of the injustice of the robo-debt scheme became clear. For the Commission to announce that its first decision since being established is to do nothing on a matter that is seen as not only grave, but also as a quite clear-cut instance of corrupt behaviour by public officials, as revealed by the Royal Commission, brings its entire function, its powers, and the perception of its powers into question. Quoting a tweet from Michael Bradley, tweeting as Mark Lawyers, What they don't understand is how widely devastating will be the impact of this decision to do nothing. The point of an anti-corruption commission is to establish and maintain public confidence in accountability, which has instead been shattered. End quote. For those wondering if the actions of the architects of the RoboDebt scheme can actually be considered corrupt, corruption itself is defined in the legislation that created the NAC and is available on their website. A person engages in corrupt conduct if, one, they are a public official and they breach public trust. Two, they are a public official and they abuse their office as a public official. Three, they are a public official or former public official and they misuse information they have gained in their capacity as a public official. Four, they do something that adversely affects a public official's honest or impartial exercise of powers or performance of official duties. Any person can engage in this type of corrupt conduct, even if they are not a public official themselves. The Robert Royal Commission's final report outlines in forensic detail how the public officials that designed, implemented and protected the scheme in order to keep it running longer than it should have been allowed to, could be found to have breached all four of these pillars. 
Journalist Rick Morton covered the RoboDebt scandal and its Royal Commission in detail for months. He observed, quote, The irony, of course, is that the failure to even bother to do any of this in relation to six anonymous people referred by another legal expert in Catherine Holmes, only five of whom are subject to the process the NAC claims makes them redundant, is in itself a catastrophic breach of public trust. This is the first public decision of the new authority. It screams abdication. End quote. The NAC, as conceived by the Albanese government, is not the independent fact-finding and accountability champion that independent Helen Haynes put forward in her private member's bill for a federal ICAC, or that advocates such as the Centre for Public Integrity or the Australian Democrats have called for. The Albanese government's insistence on bipartisan support for the NAC meant that transparency measures, such as public hearings, were jettisoned in order to ensure the coalition parties in the opposition would support the passage of the legislation to found the NAC. In its first decision, it has revealed itself incapable of completing the task it was created for, which is to hold the powerful to account and ensure that when corrupt or criminal behaviour by public or elected officials is uncovered, justice is not only done, but seen to be done. Quoting a tweet from Greg Jericho, Chief Economist to the Australia Institute and Guardian columnist, The government needs to urgently review the legislation and operation of the NAC. This case has found it totally wanting in respect of its powers and perception of its power. Hearings must be public. Start over and do it properly this time. End quote. Openness, accountability, truth, and the public's right to know are essential principles and protections in a democracy. A body like the NAC is the last line of defence in ensuring that those that serve the nation are held to account for their actions. It must be given the appropriate powers and scope to complete this function. Additionally, there must be earlier lines of defence in our institutional and public spheres to ensure that corrupt or criminal behaviour by public and elected officials does not happen in the first place, as outlined by our accountability policy platform. So here's the thing that inspired me to write that article and inspired me to do this podcast in order to provide updates and put more context around that article. Since Federation, there have been any number of scandals and public malfeasance in Australian politics. There's a reason why the tagline of a political party whose raison d'etre is transparency, accountability and integrity in public office is keep the bastards honest. Although exactly what is a bastard and how to spot one is a topic for another day. Of all the scandals, all the incompetence, all the ways in which governments have failed Australians since we federated as a nation, nothing comes close to the sheer evil bastardry of robo-debt. The genesis of it, the implementation of it, the fight to keep it operating, and the cover-up of not just its bastardry, but its criminality is genuinely breathtaking. Regular listeners to the podcast will know that I tend to sum up the culture and worldview of the Liberal Party by saying that they would hunt poor people for sport if they thought they could get away with it. And where that comes from is robo-debt. They didn't hunt poor people for sport, but they literally hounded people to their deaths for no other reason than they were poor and they were a convenient and easy target that the government of the day thought no one cared about. And they nearly got away with it. That Royal Commission almost didn't happen. It took a change of government. It took enormous public outrage and agitation. And years and years of work by the victim survivors of robo-debt and their advocates to make this the public scandal that it is. It's quite possible that we wouldn't have a National Anti-Corruption Commission without robo-debt. The scandal of robo-debt lent weight to the argument for a federal ICAC. It was such a clear-cut, black-and-white, in-your-face example of why we needed an independent body 
that could investigate and prosecute corruption and abuse of power at the federal level. And that's why the NAC, in its first public decision since being established as that body, declining to open an investigation into the architects of robo-debt is such a slap in the face, not just to the victim survivors of robo-debt and the families of those who didn't survive it, but the public as a whole. Here's Geoffrey Watson, SC, being interviewed by Philip Adams on his reaction to the next decision. It, it just seems to me to be a, a different kind of corruption inquiry. I've been involved in a few, and they always involve money or power. Well, this one's quite different. RoboDip was quite different because it involved human lives. You pick that up in your beautiful opening. These were human lives, not only the man who commits suicide, but his family. And it's just awful. So it's a new dimension, a much worse kind of thing. And when we talk about the seriousness of this, how can you look past the fact that a Royal Commissioner examined it and said, this is so serious, I'm going to refer it off to this specialist body to do something about it. And when that specialist body, the NAC, turned its back on it, that was just a disappointment to the whole community. I, I guess the Royal Commissioner herself will not say what she really feels. So the NAC took nearly a year to conclude that it was unlikely it would obtain significant new evidence, but clearly Catherine Holmes believed there was enough evidence to warrant the referral. Well, I just do not understand it. The referral suggests that evidence had been compiled and placed with NAC, which then would only have to use limited resources to follow up on it. And why did that take a year? Thankfully, Geoffrey Watson wasn't alone in feeling like that. It took only a week after the NAC's announcement that they weren't opening an investigation for the inspector of the National Anti-Corruption Commission, which is the body that watches the watchman, to announce that it was opening an investigation into that decision. And the reason it's doing that is that it received almost 900 complaints from the public about the NAC's decision. Now, this unfolded really quickly. As a member of the Australian Democrats comms team, I am terminally online, and I still manage to miss this. But from what I can work out, a campaign to lodge complaints about the decision with the next regulator was started on the site formerly known as Twitter by citizen journalist Ronnie Salt. Ronnie says that in her complaint to the regulator about the NAC, she highlighted the fact that in none of its announcements about the RoboDebt decision, did the NAC make the public aware of their right to complain about it? All the NAC did was provide a link to mental health support services for those people who might find the decision difficult. The beauty of this campaign, starting on Twitter and ending with the NAC's regulator launching its own investigation, is that the original fight against RoboDebt itself started on Twitter and ended in the class action lawsuit against the Morrison government over RoboDebt and then in the Royal Commission into RoboDebt. So if your perception of social media is that it's a toxic wasteland that traumatises our teenagers and destroys their attention spans, there's considerably more to it than that. Things that have had their genesis on social media can and do change the country, often for the better. The NAC inspector, Gail Furness, said that she had received almost 900 complaints about NAC's decision and that, quote, many of those complaints allege corrupt conduct or maladministration by the NAC in making that decision, end quote. I have to stress, I am not a lawyer and I have absolutely no legal training, but corrupt conduct by the National Anti-Corruption Commission is probably a stretch, although if it were to happen, the irony of the NAC being found to have acted corruptly in making this decision is not lost on me. The possibility of a finding of maladministration does seem more plausible, because on the surface, in making this decision, the NAC does appear to have abandoned its entire function. Here's Geoffrey Watson SC again, explaining the difference between the RoboDebt Royal Commission and the NAC, and why Royal Commissioner Catherine Holmes made a point of referring people to the NAC in the first place. The Saturday Papers, uh, Rick Morton said that uh, people looked to the NAC to hold individuals to account in a way that the Royal Commission was unable to do. So please talk me through the different powers. 
Well, the Royal Commission only had the powers to investigate within terms of reference and to report on the facts, make findings of fact. Now, the NAC has got far more uh, broader powers. It can look at anything surrounding public sector corruption, and this clearly would fall within it. Now, that means that it can get to the bottom of what actually went on rather than being confined by the terms of reference. In addition, the NAC has its own powers of reference, which would be, again, to send the matter on to the appropriate prosecuting authorities if that was appropriate. Now, the Royal Commissioner, Holmes, she had actually withheld doing that because she felt it better to provide it to a specialist body. Okay. Now, one of the key questions here is has to be, how does the NAC define corruption? Well, corruption is really very broadly defined. And I think that there, the legislation is a is is quite wonderful. It really is just examining it, looking at anything in the public sector which would conform to a misuse of public office. It, will, it includes this, including decision-making, which is not made in the public interest, allocation of funds and grants where they're not in the public interest. It's very broad. Now, it also encompasses the ability to look at corruption, which is comprised by specific crimes. Well, that's pretty important stuff as well. We don't know because NAC won't tell us what it was that they might have even been looking at here. Frank Moles, who until recently was serving tirelessly as our Queensland State President, pointed out on our Facebook account that a similar scandal to RoboDebt erupted in Europe around the same time as when RoboDebt came to a head here. The Dutch tax authority accused more than 20,000 families of fraud and plunged many families into debt by ordering them to repay childcare allowances. Families were pursued for fraud before the courts, ordered to repay child support benefits, and denied the right to appeal over several years from 2012. An investigation into the scandal determined that fundamental principles of the rule of law were violated by the Dutch tax authority, with fraud investigations into families triggered by something as simple as an incorrectly filled out form or a missing signature. I mean, the parallels are absolutely astonishing, particularly the timeframes. Now, what's astonishing about this is that when this scandal became public, the government of the day took full responsibility for a failing system that, quote, made the government an enemy of its people, end quote, and then resigned in disgrace and triggered an election. Imagine that happening in Australia. The Abbott Turnbull Morrison government literally has blood on its hands with RoboDead. The possibility that there will be no consequences, not even a public shaming for the architects of an illegal scheme that didn't just destroy lives, it killed people, is what makes the next decision so abhorrent. I really hope that this is not the end of the robo-debt saga, and that the six anonymous people who were referred to the NAC are finally held to account and experience the full repercussions of their criminal actions and that justice is finally done. If you're listening to this before June 30, I will leave you with a gentle plea. If you like the podcast and would like to support us in making it, any donations up to the value of $1,500 are fully tax deductible. It's not just me. Everyone who contributes to the podcast invests an enormous amount of our spare time into making this happen. Even though we are all happy to donate our time and efforts, The podcast still has overheads that the party has to pay for, such as hosting, as well as subscriptions to our recording and editing software. As a non-parliamentary, minor political party, the Australian Democrats receives no government funding, we have no major corporate donors, and all of our revenue comes from our members and supporters. I know times are incredibly tough for so many right now. But if you'd like to show your support for the podcast, every dollar really does help. And we would be incredibly grateful for your support. I've put a link in the show notes to make a donation. And if you're listening to this after June 30, well, any donations you make will be gratefully accepted and will apply to the new financial year. Keep the Bastards Honest is brought to you by the Australian Democrats. This episode was edited and produced by me, Alana Mitchell. 
If you'd like to keep in touch, you can find us on Facebook, the platform formerly known as Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, Spoutable, YouTube and TikTok by searching for Australian Democrats. And you can see what we stand for, what we value and what our policy positions are at our website at democrats.org.au. Email us at info at democrats.org.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.